Victoria Derbyshire. Welcome to Liverpool, where Labour are gathering for their week in the spotlight. Is this the next Prime Minister? Sir Keir Starmer has reasons to be cheerful, fresh from a by-election victory, and well ahead in the polls. Because we're changed, we are ready to serve across Scotland and across the United Kingdom. But as he resists pledging to fully reinstate HS2, and some opponents say his party doesn't stand for anything, the Labour Party have set out their stall to do and say as little as possible and hopes no one notices. No! Will he answer calls to be bolder? I am very, very disappointed um, at the lack of ambition. So our main question this morning is, what would a Prime Minister Keir Starmer stand for? Who better to answer that question, of course, than Sir Keir Starmer himself? For the government, we'll be joined by Mark Harper. He's the Transport Secretary. And we've spoken to Sam Brown, whose testimony of abuse is part of a new BBC factual drama on Jimmy Savile. With her was Steve Coogan, who plays Savile in the series. It's quite a burden, quite a responsibility in, for me as an actor in the way I'm going to portray uh, Jimmy Savile. It's a fine balancing act about you know, how, you, how I'm going to portray him. I can't do him as a pantomime villain. Good morning, good morning. I'm standing in for Laura today and we are broadcasting live from the Museum of Liverpool, just minutes away from where the Labour conference gets underway later. On the panel today, we've got Jo Grady. She is the General Secretary of the University and College Union. Alex Baldock, who is CEO of Curry's, and Catherine Viner, who is the Editor-in-Chief of The Guardian. Good morning to all of you. Thank you for being here. Uh, let's have a quick look at some of the front pages of the papers, first of all. Now, most of them uh, are leading on the situation in Israel. There's the Sunday Times, their headline, Hostages Dragged from Homes in Israel as Families Flee Slaughter. The Observer says hundreds die and hostages held as Hamas assault shocks Israel. Uh, let's look at the Sunday Mirror, the Sunday People, I beg your pardon. They have Keir Starmer's 1.5 billion plan to save the NHS. And the Mirror has a story of, there it is, Holly and Phil healing their rift over the alleged kidnap horror that Holly Willoughby has been subjected to and Labour's 1.5 billion plan to clear the waiting list backlog. Before we come to the politics, we are going to bring you the latest on Israel, as you would expect. Last night, the country's military launched retaliatory strikes against targets in the Gaza Strip after Hamas, designated as a terror organisation by many Western governments, including the UK, launched an attack on Israel. Earlier, I spoke to the BBC's Middle East correspondent, Yolande Nell, and she gave us the latest on the situation. Well, after this unprecedented assault by Hamas militants yesterday, which saw hundreds of gunmen crossing into southern Israel from the Gaza Strip, there are still pockets of fighting going on in the south this morning. Israeli security forces say that overnight they did manage to take back control of a kibbutz where about uh, 50 Israelis were being held uh, in, in the small community's dining area. They also say that 10 militants were killed in Starot police station. This is the police station in a town which they had taken taken over. Now there is huge concern for what's believed to be dozens of Israeli soldiers and civilians, including women and children, who've been taken back as hostages into the Gaza Strip. And we've been hearing about their relatives taking things like hairbrushes, toothbrushes to a special missing persons center so that DNA samples uh, can be found. I mean, Overall, yesterday was the deadliest day of violence that Israel has seen since the Yom Kippur War, which was 50 years ago. And we've had Israel hitting back at Gaza hard, these retaliatory airstrikes. It says it's hit something like 460 targets. Um, now, in the Gaza Strip, the hospitals are overwhelmed with the casualties. Um, 
really Israel has also cut electricity to the Strip. Conditions there are getting increasingly difficult. Um, and at the same time, Palestinian militants have kept firing rockets into southern Israel uh, this morning. Right, well, what is the potential for further violence and the widening of this conflict, of this, of this armed conflict? I mean, certainly when it comes to Gaza, you can see that the Israeli military is preparing for a long campaign. It's not commenting directly on what happens about the hostages, but it has said that it's asked people uh, living in some neighborhoods in the east of Gaza, which is uh, close to the perimeter fence with Israel, to move away. That suggests there's a possible a ground invasion that's being planned, and certainly tens of thousands of uh, reservists have been called up. Uh, they could be part of this Israeli operation. Yolanda Nell, thank you. And obviously we're going to ask uh, Sakir Starmer for his take on this uh, situation in Israel. Uh, let's talk to our panel first, though, and let's talk about the politics of this week, Catherine Viner, editor-in-chief of The Guardian, because it is a very important week for Sakir Starmer and the Labour Party. That's right, yes, it could be, it should be uh, the last uh, Labour conference uh, before the election. Um, and uh, we'll be looking uh, to see uh, Starmer and the Labour Party present lots of exciting policies and inspire the nation. <laughs> Do you think that's going to happen, Alex Baldock? Well, I hope what we hear from Sakir is a continuation of the much better mood music towards business that we've heard from the Labour Party lately. Tone matters and that and the Labour Party's engagement with business uh, is much improved. And you, just to, to let our audience know, at one point you were a Conservative supporter. In recent times you've had two breakfasts with the Shadow Chancellor, Rachel Reeves. Well, I don't think that makes me special. I think everyone in London who wears a tie has had breakfast with Rachel Reeves um, in recent years. But what do you no. read into that, though, the fact that that is happening? What I read into it is that the Labour Party is taking engagement with business much more seriously. And, the, the, as I say, the tone and the mood music is much better. But what we're looking for this week is to see that translate into firm commitments, commitments for stability, but also commitments to, to provide the conditions for growth and prosperity. Joe Grady, what would you and your members want to hear from Sakir Starmer? We want to hear how they are going to sort the mess that the Tories have left us in. We have an infrastructure crisis, an NHS crisis, a housing crisis, a cost of living crisis. Um, we need to hear tangible solutions and policies that are going to have a real impact on the working people of Britain. Thank you for the moment. We'll be back with you shortly. Uh, listening to that was leader of the Labour Party, Sakir Starmer. Good morning to you. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to ask you about Israel, first of all. What is your response to what's happening there? This is an appalling attack on Israel, a terrorist attack for which there is no justification and Israel has every right to defend herself. And the perpetrators of this have deliberately pushed back the prospect of peace agreements, peace talks. And so an appalling act of terrorism. And I think everybody is shocked. I spoke to my counterpart, the leader of the Israeli Labour Party, last night um, and heard for myself the anxiety, the concern. As we were on the phone, the siren went off and she had to go down into the shelter taking her papers with her. So it's an appalling act of terrorism. It needs to be called out across the world. OK. So, as Catherine was saying, it's likely to be the last party conference yes. before the general election. It's really crucial for you. And at the Conservative conference last week, Rishi Sunak claimed he was the change candidate and that you would stick with the status quo. I'm sure you're going to disagree with that. But on behalf of our yes. audience today, just to set out what we'd like to do is we, we really want to understand for them more about the changes that the country might expect if you become Prime Minister and, and how you might respond to Rishi Sunak. So let's start with a new policy that you're announcing today for the NHS in England. To get waiting lists down, you're going to ask doctors and nurses to volunteer to work overtime at weekends. They will be paid extra with the money coming in from your changes to the non-DOM status. Aren't NHS staff already burned out, though? They're working very hard, but let me just explain why we're doing this. Um, because economic growth has been very, very poor for 13 years. And everything you hear from Labour this week will be about the economy, about raising living standards across the whole of the country. One of the drags on that is the fact that 7.7 .7 million people are on a waiting list. 
and everybody, I think, knows somebody, a relative, a friend, who's on a waiting list. But what if doctors there's, and nurses don't want to work weekends? Well, there's the health implications of that, obviously, and there's then the drag on the economy. So far as our plan is concerned, it's for two million appointments every year, 40,000 a week, to be done out of hours, but paying staff properly to do it. Many of those staff um, are willing to do this. We have spoken to the staff, to staffing organisations and across the board, but it's a plan to actually bring down two million appointments every year, that waiting list, but desperately given, given needed, and, and given be a some, huge boost for the economy. Given some doctors are working in the private sector at the weekends, when you actually have to change their contracts to make this happen? You don't need to change the contracts for this because we will pay at the proper rates for out of hours. More, it's more than they get in the private sector? Well, this is to pay out of hours. And many of them Is that are, more than they get in the we, private we, sector? They will probably get more in the private sector, but we've seen examples... So why, why are they going to switch then? We've seen examples of this working in different parts of the country. We've talked to the NHS staff about this. It's a plan to take uh, to get rid of the non-DOM tax status. That's obviously the loophole that allows very rich people to avoid paying their tax in this country and to use that money to pay for these extra hours and bring down uh, the waiting list. But you've, just, you've, just, uh, you've just acknowledged that they do get paid more in the private sector. And I'm asking you, why then would a doctor or nurse switch from that higher pay to work for less at the weekends in the NHS to help you bring down the waiting list? Because they want to bring down the waiting list as well. There's yeah, a but they huge also want to pay strain. their bills. There's a huge strain on the health service. My, my wife works for the NHS. I get a daily insight into the morale in our hospitals uh, in this particular one in London. They desperately want to bring down this waiting list. That's why we've talked to them. We're not going to impose this. It's a voluntary scheme. They're up for this. They're up for this because they know that bring down their waiting list will reduce the pressure on them in the long run. Right. And we need to do this. We, we can't have... This is unprecedented. 7.7 million people it does, on the waiting list. It does sound like, essentially, you're going to rely on the goodwill of NHS staff to, to step up there. We're going to pay them properly to do it. We're talking to them about it. They want to do this just as much as we do. Okay. And it is desperately needed. We need growth in our economy. We need to Let raise living standards across the country. We will never do that with the mess that this government's made of the NHS. Let's talk about growth then. Um, as I understand it, there isn't any extra money for public services if Labour win the next election. You've pledged that you're not going to borrow for day-to-day -day spending in the NHS and on schools, social care, other public services, because, as you've just said this morning a number of times, the way to fund the public services is through growth. If you don't get that growth, that means there will be no money, extra money for public services, correct? I'm confident we can get the growth. That's Con why confident. we have worked through a, a plan that tells you how we're going to get the growth, the people that we need, the skills that we need. We've set out a policy on skills just this morning to get the skills in the right area. The partnership with business, this is crucial. This will not be state control. It won't be pure free markets. It'll be a partnership with business. What businesses say to me is they need stability. They need that platform. There are plenty of investors who are absolutely clear in their discussions with me. Can I they say we will invest in the UK if the circumstances are right, but at the moment, because of this government, there's too much chopping and changing, changing of mind and chaos, and they're holding off for investment. We have to create the conditions for the growth in this country. Let me come back to my question, if I may. If you don't get that growth, that means there'll be no extra money for public services. I am yes? confident that we will get that growth. It is and the if you don't? It is the single... Um, defining mission of an incoming Labour government. I've set out five missions, five purpose-driven things that we will go for over five and ten and, years. And one Every, of them is the highest sustained growth in the G7. It is the central so, so one. It's not just one of them. Okay. It is the central mission well, then of the incoming Labour government. Because Great. everything else hangs off that. Absolutely. And I'm asking, what if you don't get it? I'm confident that we will. That's Wait, why we've worked so confident. hard. Confident. That's like crossing your fingers. No, it's not. That's what the government's been doing. If you're co I'm confident because we've got a strategic plan. I'm confident because I've listened to businesses who say to me, these are the impediments in my way. I've said to businesses, look, infrastructure, how long would it take you, for example, to build a wind farm? I'm told about two years physically 
but about 13 years before we actually get any power out of it. That means we've got to go at pace to deal with the planning that sits in the way of it. We've got to go at pace to deal with the grid, which is far too slow. So my confidence comes not from coming on here and simply asserting it this Sunday morning, but because of months and years of careful conversations with those that will be delivering this with okay. us. I'm absolutely confident so, that with the right strategy in place, with the right foundation in place, we can do what we need to do, which is grow the economy. And, and, how, and how long will it take? Well, we think we can start this straight away. I mean, but some how, of the... How soon do you expect to see higher growth than we've had, say, in the last 10 years? Very quickly. And investment in public services. Very quickly under a Labour government. Like a year? Two we've, years? Three years? What? Some of the change that we need to make can be done very quickly. Right, so take, when would you take, expect that to lead through to growth and therefore more money for public services? Take planning. We can deal with that very, very quickly. Could you answer the question, quickly. please, first? We think that this can happen very quickly within months of a Labour government turning in. We can turn this around and get the investment that we need. Investors are ready to join us in this venture. They are holding off at the moment because of the instability. I want to ensure that our country is no longer held back and can move forward okay. under growth. One more thing about growth that is really important. Briefly, please. We don't just, um, ev you know, everybody in a sense wants growth. You need a strategy and a plan. But we want growth across the whole of the country. So not just growth in London and the South East and redistribution as a one word uh, plan for the rest of the country, growth everywhere. And that's why in addition to businesses, we've been talking to our local mayors about economic hubs and how we drive this across okay. the whole of the United Can Kingdom. Can I just put this to you? Growth, including productivity growth, has been slowing across much of the developed world since about 2005. It's not just a feature of the Conservative government here in the UK. So are you well, claiming that the UK under a Labour government can somehow buck this global trend? Yes, and I'll tell you for why. One looking back, one looking forward. If you look at growth under the last Labour government, if we had had growth at the same rate as we had under the last Labour government... Totally different it, circumstances. Just, hear me out, please. If we had had growth in the last 13 years at the same rate as we've had growth... Uh, under this failed government, then we would have tens of billions of pounds to spend on our public services. Looking forward, the race is on for the next generation of jobs. You can see that in America with the Inflation Reduction Act, which is like a magnet for investment. The EU has got a response to that. Our government is sitting on its hands. The race is on. We should be in that race. I am confident talking to our partners, that we can get ahead in that race okay. and we can be the winners for the next generation of jobs. But we will not get there by sitting on our hands. We will not get there by being defeatist about it. We will get there through hard work, a strategic plan, work through with our partners, knowing the people that we need in place, with the skills in place, the okay. investment that we need, and a government prepared to be active and take the tough decisions to ensure this happens. Let's move on to housing. Huge issue yeah. for so many people watching right now. It's not one of your five missions. Why, given the scale of the problem? Well, it is within the mission, which is to, uh, about opportunity. So we've got five missions. Obviously, growing the economy is the number one, and this is relevant to housing, of course. But another of the missions is about opportunity, breaking the class ceiling. That's about education skills, but it's also about housing because we don't build enough houses. Uh, the dream of home ownership has been completely shattered under this government. We need to turn that round, partly obviously for the, for the individuals and families who desperately need a secure home, a roof over their head, but and also because it drives economy. If you're a business and those that you might employ can't afford to live near where your business is, your business is unlikely to take off. So this is also about growth. Right. Yesterday your deputy described it as a Tory housing crisis and said Labour would increase affordable homes by getting tough on developers and yeah. reforming the planning laws. How many houses need to be built each year, would you say, to fix the housing crisis? I think about... Um, well, we, our aspiration would be over a five-year period to get to a million and a half. Right, so a what's million that every year? Do well, the maths for me. Well, that, that, that's 250,000 um, or just over 300,000 a year. But okay. um, we need to get to a million and a half. But we, need, we can't just pluck a figure because every political party plucks a figure. We need well, to you, understand... You, uh, well, no, you've no, just but, plucked a figure? Yes, but that won't happen unless you take the steps that we are setting out. OK. What the and let, let me tell you that the Centre for Cities say ending the houses, housing crisis in the next 25 years would require England to add 442,000 homes every year. 
Yes. Well, look. So that's almost. No, 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 it's not. It, 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 well, we, we can argue about the figures, but it's not a million miles from what we're saying. But, look, talking about it isn't going to achieve it. What's happened under this government is they've taken the targets down. Um, that's because Rishi Sunak was too weak to stand up but to his own But is this your new target, then? So we 300,000? The, we put the targets back up to get building happening. We have to challenge the planning laws. We have to get real about where we're going to build, and we have to work with developers to get there at speed. Okay. This can be done, but it will never be done by a government that simply takes down targets because the Prime Minister is too weak to stand up to his own party. And just so our audience is clear, are you saying your target is going to be 300,000 a year? I'm saying a million and a half houses over the five years, I hope, of an incoming Labour government. OK. Social housing, specifically, let's yes. talk about that. The National Housing Federation says 90,000 social homes a year are needed. How will you make sure that figure, if not more, are built? Well, I think here we have to work with local authorities who are the drivers of social housing because we do need this affordable housing. At the moment, what happens, I've seen this for myself um, in Camden, is that local authorities can use a procedure, slightly technical, Section 106 uh, notices, to leverage in social housing um, with developers as they build in any given area. We need to strengthen that and make it more robust to ensure that that social housing, that affordable housing, is part of the development across uh, the whole country. In some areas it's being done really well, in other areas not so much, but we need to drive. So we've got the house building um, in its own right mm. as a project, this alongside it for affordable ho uh, houses. And, what, and if developers say to you, look, what you're suggesting is actually not financially viable, you risk no affordable houses being built. Well, what happens in practice is that developers say it is viable uh, when they seek the permission in the first place and then later on say that the circumstances have changed and it's no longer viable. We need to strengthen the guidance, strengthen the to framework strengthen to the ensure guidance. that that doesn't happen. Why is that going to make developers build affordable housing? Well, the way the process works is that for permission to be given, you have a 106 process, which means it is conditional on social housing. Yes. Therefore, you can build conditional on the social housing. Yes. We need to make sure that that contract holds. What happens in practice is the contract is made and over time it yields um, and they're not held to it. We need to hold them to it. That and how, is, will you, how, how will you hold them to it? Well, that is about the statutory framework. That is about well, the so, guidance. So, so, what, what, so they'd be breaking the law if they didn't do it? Well, what happens in practice is this agreement is made. No, but what would you do? The agreement is made, it's challenged, it then usually ends up in court yeah. because there isn't clarity about the guidance. So, so if we can crack... That is where these projects fall down. And if we can crack that, we can crack on with social housing sure. and Sure, but it housing. sounds like if you, if you make the guidance clearer, suddenly private developers clearer, are going to... Clearer, stronger, more robust. I can tell and you... It, and, if, and if they still don't do it, what will you do? This, I've seen this by myself. And I'm asking you what you'd the, do if the developers say, look, it's just not financially viable. What will you actually do? Well the whole contract falls then and they can't build at all. So that is right. not a good place for them to end up in. Well, that's it, the problem, isn't it? So there'll be no, no houses no, no. built at all. The problem is it breaks down further down the line, ends up in court, and we need to stop okay. that happening. But, you know, this, this is... It is technical stuff, but it is the single biggest problem in building that social housing. Okay. And what Let, I, just to give confidence in this, there are some places, some authorities, where this is working really well. It's just not working everywhere. And we want to make sure it is working everywhere. You have described yourself as a pragmatist in the past. You've, you said you made a pragmatic decision to um, abandon some pledges when you were trying to become leader, like bringing rail, mail, energy and water into common ownership. With that in mind, tomorrow the Supreme Court begins a hearing into whether the government's plan to send asylum seekers to Rwanda is legal. You've made it clear you oppose the policy because you don't think it will work. If the Supreme Court rules it is legal and flights to Rwanda begin to take off and the numbers crossing the channel on small boats decline, i.e. so it's working, would you still reverse it? Yes. Why? I think it's the wrong policy. It's hugely expensive. It's a tiny number, a tiny number of individuals who would go to Rwanda. And the real problem is at source. So the even, real... if it's, even if everybody can see it's working... The criminal gangs are declining, fewer people are getting in those boats, fewer people are drowning, you would still reverse it, well, even if it was working. Putting this to me on the basis that it's working, we've been told by the government time and again that what they're saying, even saying 
uh, that they've got a Rwanda scheme will reduce the numbers. That I hasn't know, but, happened. I'm, if but if let you me, say let me... you're a pragmatist and you can see it's working, you're, you're telling our audience now you'd still reverse it. Let me tell you pragmatically what I'd do about this issue, because nobody wants to see these crossings across the channel. That will, they will only stop if we smash the criminal gangs who are running this vile trade. Now, before I was a politician, I was director of public prosecutions for five years, and that meant I worked with other countries coordinating a plan to smash terrorist gangs, um, to smash gangs that were people smuggling. Those boats that are being used now across the Channel are being made to order, they're being transported across by gangs to the northern coast of France, and people making millions of pounds are putting people in that boat. We have to break that. I am convinced we can. I've okay. seen it happen. And we start there. Because you don't start by what are you going to do at the end of the process when you fail to control your borders. You start by controlling your borders. Okay. You've then also got to process the claims because I think most people would be shocked to learn that of all the people that arrived by small boat in the last year or so, 1% have had their claims processed. So no wonder we've got, at the taxpayer's expense, lots and lots of people in hotel accommodation okay. causing this problem. We have so got a great... I, as a pragmatist, I want a pragmatic plan that is actually going to fix this problem, not rhetoric, which has got this government absolutely nowhere. I don't know if you've seen, but if you've been watching this programme in the last few weeks, you will have seen um, other leaders been shown research by the organisation More in Common, asking people to say in one or two words what each, what they think each party leader stands seen that. for. You have. What do you hope they said about you? Look, I don't know, but I think. What you're do about you hope to, they I say think about you? Yeah, I think you're about to tell me. Well, but, go on. What do you hope they say well, about look, you? Well, look, we've got an incredible week this week to set out our stall. Okay. And that, you're that, not going to tell gives me. Us the chance. Let's have a look at it. Let's have a look. So, the, I mean, there's some. There's nothing, don't know, working class, Labour himself, not sure, Labour Party, equality, fairness. How do you feel about that? I've had a lot worse thrown at me <laughs> in my life. Um, but look, if you take, um, you know, I can see uh, don't know in there. And nothing. Which, you and, stand for nothing. Yeah. But the question is, what do you think Sakir Starmer stands for? Yeah. Nothing. Well, that is why this week is so important for us. We come here to this, the last conference before a general election, to set out our positive case. I've been very clear about my job, which was to take over the Labour Party and take us from the worst general election victory uh, loss since 1935, that was our last general election, to a Labour Party that can win the general election. That required me to be disciplined, to change the party at speed and ruthlessly to expose both the Tories and the SNP in Scotland as not fit to govern, and then to set out and answer the question, if not them, then why us? So we're bang on schedule. We've already set out uh, in five missions what we're going to do, so we've already answered that question. What we need to do here in Liverpool is bring it together to weld together, if you like, the reassurance that people need in times like this with the hope that they want built on top of that for not just fixing the problems, but taking our country forward. Finally, last week, Laura asked Rishi Sunak what he admires about you. What do you admire about Rishi Sunak? I admire the fact that on the day he was elected Prime Minister, he made a point of phoning me for a one-to-one -one conversation. And in that conversation, we agreed that we would, you know, challenge each other robustly on the things that we needed to challenge each other on. But when it came to national security and to terrorism, we would stand together. And I think I admire that. I think it was the right thing to do. I think for a prime minister and leader of the opposition to say there are some things of such national importance that we will work together and stand together is good for our country. So I admire that. Thank you very much for talking to us this morning. Sir Keir Starmer. Uh, enjoy your conference. Thank you very Thank much. You. Uh, let's talk to our panel. We have Catherine Viner, Editor-in-Chief of The Guardian, Alex Baldock, CEO of Curry's, and Joe Grady, who is General Secretary of the University and College Union. Uh, what do you think? I mean, gosh, didn't that sort of give you a sense of the uh, challenges that a new Labour government would inherit if they get in? You know, the challenges on the NHS, the challenges on, on housing, on immigration. Do you think Sir Keir Starmer had the answers? He had some of the beginnings of the answers, but I feel like it's such an enormous challenge that's going to face them, um, that they're clearly going to mean no quick, quick fixes. Joe, what did you think about the fact that NHS staff will be asked to work overtime at the weekends to help bring down the waiting list? 
I'll be honest with you, I think it was quite underwhelming. I think the 7 million people on waiting lists will find it underwhelming. I think the staff in the NHS who have been on the receiving end of underpaid you know, salaries, overwork, billions of pounds going on dodgy COVID contracts rather than their workplaces will find it underwhelming too. And the reason I say that is the answer to this crisis cannot be asking those people to work weekends. We need an injection of money in the NHS. And I worry that the Labour Party are paralysed by fear and relive that moment of, you remember the note of there's no money left? And, and that is really impacting on their ability to offer forward solutions and policies that will challenge austerity that have left us where we are. Alex, you're coming from, obviously, the business point of view. You heard uh, Sir Keir Starmer talk about changing the planning regulations. Is that enough? Did you hear, I mean, he said he's confident he can do it. Are you? Well, it's certainly a problem. And well, first of all, some positives. Mm -hmm. uh, it's good that the Labour Party is emphasising growth and, and it can be a bit abstract growth. But what growth means is more jobs, more investment, higher living standards. For if everybody. it happens. If it happens. But that's the right thing to target, at least. And some of the things he's talking about, about skills and infrastructure and planning, are certainly need, needed for reform. You ask about planning specifically, it's certainly a problem. It's got much worse. It takes more than twice as long to get anything approved as it did three or four years ago. I mean, one chief executive told me that uh, a company, he's, that his company was, has built in the, the same time as it took to get permission to build one factory in the UK, had helped build the entire Shanghai to Beijing Express Railway. And this wow. can't be, no, there might be other reasons to prefer <laughs> to live here than in China, but the, that can't be right. So uh, some of the diagnosis, yes, but what we're looking for now is specific commitments that we think in skills, in infrastructure, in taxation and in regulation like planning can give us confidence of an improvement. Uh, obviously, Rishi Sunak said last week he was the change candidate. He was claiming to be the change candidate Rishi, uh, and he said Sir Keir Starmer was more of the status quo. Do you think Sir Keir Starmer needs to be bolder? I think it's a really interesting um choice facing Labour. I think it, our, our Guardian readers are quite divided on this subject. Some of them think this incredibly cautious approach is really good. The most important thing is just winning the election, getting this terrible government out. So, but others sort of say, I've got, I can't just have something to vote against. I need something to vote for. Inspire me. Give me hope. I was speaking to a senior Labour figure yesterday who said they're specifically not using words like radical and bold uh, because they think that puts people off, frightens people, and it's all very much a reassurance uh, strategy. Um, and as I say, I think, I think there's, um, there's different views of that. Okay. Um... D does Keir Starmer, Joe Grady, have broad support across the unions, would you say? I think in terms of what union members want and our union members, we do need to see whether they use the language of bold mm -hmm. is sort of irrelevant. We do need to see policies that do give people hope. Um, you know, we need to see, you know, if you, I, I said at the beginning of this show, the railways, most of our infrastructure, the NHS, housing, education, all of these things are on their knees and the people who work within them are too. And I think to, to not offer forward policies that address those um, is going to be a huge issue for how we actually deal with you know, this Labour government future that is being discussed. Mm. And our members deserve more, all of the workers do. L can I ask you, Joe Grady, about some of your members? Uh, obviously, industrial action this year has disrupted um, the life of students mm. and some of your members are now unhappy. There have been votes of no confidence passed in you. Are you considering your position? No. I mean, what we're doing Why is... Not? Because we... Look, there will always be disagreements within unions. That but, happens. They're big democratic organisations. But, a, but a, a, a vote of no confidence in a number of institutions. But we have thousands of members, and as I say, there is always democratic discussion and debate. We expect that. Um, and for what it's worth, there's a general secretary election very shortly, so everybody will get their will say. You, will you stand again? Um, I don't want to talk about whether I'm standing again when this is about you two members, right? I do not want to be the storyline when the story is, as you started with your question, 70,000 members in higher education right now voting for strike action, and you two members, if you're watching, vote yes. Uh, college lecturers voting for strike action. And if we go back to some of the policy pledges here today, if you are a college lecturer, you will be earning perhaps £25,000. 
the average house price, even outside of London, is nearly £300,000. So when we are talking about UCU members and what we need and what we need from a Labour government, it is addressing, not just asking people like NHS workers to work weekends to clear backlogs, that is not the answer. It is answers that inject money into these, uh, whether it's education, NHS and so on, okay. and give us a route out of this mess. Okay. Catherine, let me ask you, if I may, about some criticism that has been put to you as editor of The Guardian for not supporting some of your journalists like Hadley Freeman like Suzanne Moore. Hadley Freeman, for example, said she wasn't allowed to write about Mermaids, which is a charity that supports trans children, or interview people who some call gender critical. Suzanne Moore said she felt bullied by some colleagues and not supported by management. Do you, as editor-in-chief, take responsibility for that? I mean, I'd obviously... Uh, uh don't recognise that characterisation in any case. And I think if you actually read what's published in The Guardian on the issue of trans rights, gender critical feminism, rather what people say on Twitter, I think you'd find a much more pluralistic um, range of views uh, than is represented though, is on it? Twitter. Um, I think if you, look, if you look at the society as a whole, society is very divided on this subject. I think the Labour Party is divided on this subject. Um, all, all parts of British society are discussing this subject. Um, and I think you will find more sub, uh, views represented on The Guardian than in other news organisations. I think we do try to have a conversation and a debate. And it's complicated. You know, I, don't, I think... I don't think, I don't particularly want our journalists to be single issue journalists. I want them to have a range of perspectives. And so um, that's what I say about that. Alex Baldock, you employ 35,000 people? Getting on for. Yeah, millions of customers. Where would you say your customers and your staff are when it comes to the cost of living? Well, first of all, I mean, we, as you say, we see it this up close with Curry's serving 80% of UK households as we do. And there's a lot of pressure out there and a lot of families are struggling. There's no doubt about that. Equally, I think you can overdo the gloom. Um, employment remains high. Consumer confidence is now at its highest since January last year. Inflation appears to have peaked, as do interest rates. Um, and people still have, a lot of people still have a decent amount of savings in the bank. Um, and what we're seeing, our business in the UK is on a good track. Okay. Thank you for the moment. We'll be back with you. Uh, we are going to talk to the Transport Secretary right now because last week Rishi Sunak cancelled HS2, as you know, from Birmingham to Manchester and said the £36 billion saved would instead be spent on dozens of other transport projects right around the country. So let's speak to Mr Harper. He is the Transport Secretary. Good morning to you, Mr Harper. Good morning, Tori. Uh, we've seen, obviously, shocking images coming out of Israel. Uh, we spoke to our correspondent a little earlier who gave us the latest. Obviously, you will be monitoring the situation uh, within the government. Are you expecting things to escalate further? Well, look, first of all, the events we saw yesterday with that, uh, the barbaric attacks by Hamas on Israel are truly shocking. And the government's position is very clear. We are unequivocally supporting Israel. Uh, in this uh, set of events and their support, their right of self-defence uh, and will support them uh, in whatever they decide to do to defend their country against the terrorist attacks. On the issue of individuals, we're obviously working closely and talking to the Israeli government about any British citizens in Israel and obviously will continue to well, do can, so. Can and my I... own department is working closely with British Airlines that fly in that part of the world to make sure they've got all of the information they have to make sure they can continue to keep their passengers safe. We are hearing that uh, a British woman, and this has come from the Israeli embassy, a British woman has reported that her son is missing amid fears that he has been taken to Gaza. Uh, do you have any information on that? And if it's true, how can you help her? So I don't have any specific, specific information on that and obviously I wouldn't discuss such things I think are, are on air but the government will remain in touch with the Israeli authorities and we will do everything we can to support any British citizens in Israel and obviously their families back here in the United Kingdom. OK. Let's talk about your brief now, transport. It's fair to say that some of the transport announcements you made this week have confused some people. On Wednesday, the government released a document which promised £100 million in funding for a mass transit system to revolutionise travel in and around Bristol. Now, that document was pretty swiftly removed from the government website and, new, and a new one put up in its place. So can you clear things up for viewers? Is Bristol going to get a new mass transit system? 
Yeah, so we, we published a... Do my department published a document which set out very clearly uh, what we're going to spend the £36 billion on that we're saving from cancelling the second phase of HS2. Uh, the money that was so promised is Bristol for going Bristol to get is a new for £100 million, it's £100 million extra for the um, uh, elected mayor of the West of England Combined Authority, and that's money that he will have available to spend uh, on his projects, including on a mass transit system, which is... Uh, already some of those things are already being delivered. I was in Bristol myself relatively recently opening a new station as part of that imp implementation of in increased transport projects. Right, so it's going to happen? So there's £100 million pounds extra available for the West of England Mayor for him to spend on his projects, one of which that he is developing, and I know because I've spoken to him about it, is to deliver a mass transit system in Bristol. Look, I'd make a virtue of the fact that one of the things we're able to do is give significant amounts of extra money to elected mayors for them to spend on the priorities that they determine are right for the parts of the country that they represent, okay, rather so than all those so, decisions so being so taken I'll... at Westminster. Understood, but it went from a clear promise from you and the Prime Minister to a maybe. No, it's a clear promise um, of £100 million for the West of England mayor for him to spend on his priorities, and one of his priorities is delivering that mass is, transit yeah, system. F fair enough. Which, which, yeah, which is not what the original document said. Let me ask something else. Again, the deleted document said, the Leam side line, which is in the northeast of England, closed in 1964, will be reopened. Will it? Yeah, so, we, so we published in our document the plans that we're going to give a significant amount of money, £1.8 billion going to the North East elected mayor. And one of those things that I know is a priority in that area is the Leam side line. And we're going to start working on a business case for that. Um, so if the North of East mayor decides to deliver that, he now has the funds to do so. Right. So again, it sounds like it's gone from a clear promise, a clear announcement earlier this week, to... We're working on a business plan. Well, well, no, uh, let me the, ask you about the, Manchester. The point is, significant amounts of money are now available with the cancellation of HS2 to give that money to elected mayors in all parts of the country, whether it's the North East, uh, Manchester or the West Midlands, for them to spend on the priorities they determine are important sure. for the people I they mean, represent. It, That's it, much better than it, it all it, being it, decided by the government at Westminster. But if that is the point, then why do you release a document saying the Leam side line, closed in 1964, will also be reopened? Why release a document saying Bristol's going to get a new mass transit well, system? Because we gave some examples... And why delete for, it? We gave some examples to people about the sorts of things, and we know these things are priorities locally, the sorts of things that that money could be spent on to bring they it to life examples. for people. I've got the original and we know document, those are local priorities. Harper. OK, they weren't examples. I've got the original document. It's right here. The Leam, I'm sorry to keep repeating the same point, but the Leam side line closed in 1964 will be reopened. Bristol will get a new mass transit system. Let me ask you about Manchester. In the deleted document, you promised a link road between the M62 and the M60, a project that was already announced back in 2020. The new document talks about two projects in Manchester. Which new roads is Manchester going to get? Well, look, just on the point about things that have been announced before, often projects will be announced and there'll be, there'll be development funding for them to be uh, worked, a detailed plan to be worked up. But part of the point about the extra money that's available is it's now available to actually deliver these projects. So there are a number of projects which had been developed but hadn't got any further than that. And the advantage of cancelling HS2, why, the second phase, means we can them again, invest them and deliver them. Right, so you announced something in 2020 that you were never going to be able to deliver, but now you've cancelled HS2 from Birmingham to Manchester, you can deliver it. Is but that what you're you, saying? When you deliver a lot of these transport projects, you have to provide funding you and you start, a lot of transport you start developing plans for them, but then you have to make available the funding to deliver them. Let me give you another example from last week. There's a very good plan to expand capacity uh, in the east of England, in the Ely area, for both transport, uh, for passenger uh, and freight uh, uh, capacity on the railways. That plan's been well worked up. We wanted to deliver it, but until we had the funds available from cancelling the second phase of HS2, we didn't have the funds available to do it. We're now able to commit to delivering that plan. That'll be a huge benefit to that part of the country and for growing the economy. So that's the difference. Cancelling phase two of HS2 frees up 
funds to actually deliver some of these projects that we've wanted okay. to do, but HS2 was consuming all of the available transport spending. So you shouldn't really have announced, for example, the, the link road between the M60 and the M62 back in 2020, but let's move on. I'm, tr I'm trying to get you to be clear because, as you know, Rishi, you were there. Rishi Sunak claimed he was the change candidate on Wednesday. He said he's going to do things differently. But that, just from this one interview, there is a kind of pattern, isn't there? Rishi Sunak backed HS2, then he scrapped it. Boris Johnson backed a new station in Bradford, then he scrapped it. Then Liz Truss reinstated it. Then Rishi Sunak as PM scrapped it. Now he says he's doing it again. It's the same with the, 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 the A1, making it a dual carriageway from Northumberland to Scotland. It's the same with electrifying the train line to Hull. Is it on? Is it off? The announcements you've made this week, you can't guarantee any of them will happen, which is not really a change. It's more inconsistency and more uncertainty for voters. No, it's not. It's actually demonstrating that by cancelling the second phase of HS2, and, look, and I accept not everyone will agree with that, but because the facts change, we made a different decision. What that's enabled us to do is free up money to invest in transport projects across the country. You mentioned Bradford. I went to Bradford on Thursday. I met the uh, Labour leader of the council there. I met the West Yorkshire mayor to talk about this project. They welcomed that investment. They've got ambitious plans for the city, and this extra transport investment means that those in, uh, plans are now able to be delivered. They'll see more growth in that city, which is welcome, not just for people who live in the city, but in the surrounding area. So they welcomed those plans, but we weren't able to fund them until we made the decision that we did to cancel the second phase of HS2. So I think that's very clear. It's a decision taken, it's funding freed up, and clear plans about what we're going to deliver instead. And that's been welcomed. Thank you very much for talking to us this morning. Thank Pleasure. you. Mark Harper, who is the Transport Secretary. Now, a new factual drama series based on the story of serial sex offender and paedophile Jimmy Savile is starting on BBC One tomorrow. We're going to play you a trailer now and just to let you know that some viewers might find it upsetting. I'm not an act. What you see is what you get. You'll be in touch. He's our man. He was one of the biggest manipulators of people to rise to the status that he did. The investigation found no evidence to justify the allegations. And do you consider that to be the end of the matter? He groomed the whole nation. There are rumours that there's another sign to you. What rumours might those be? It gets away with it because no one else sees it. It's a violation. As old as I am now, I would have danced on his grave. It's called The Reckoning. Some critics have questioned whether the series sufficiently holds the BBC to account, and others have asked whether it should have been made at all. I've been talking to Sam Brown, one of the survivors whose experience is told in this drama, and to Steve Coogan, who plays Jimmy Savile. I began by asking about the criticism. For somebody to criticise something they've not seen says a lot. It, it, it shouts out that it is not something you're comfortable to see. Well, as a child, or even as a vulnerable adult, the abuse we went through, that was not comfortable. That was not easy. And it is still happening. You know, I, I, I work for social services and I love my job and I'm a foster mum. People seem to think this is a rare occurrence. It's not. You know, up my road, there could be five, six, seven children, vulnerable people that are being abused every single day. It's very, very current and it will always be current. And to close your mind off to something you can learn from, I find that quite difficult to understand. Steve, I wonder if you can describe for our audience how you got into this character, playing Jimmy Savile, because he was everywhere on TV and radio and he has become so reviled. Um, well, it, I thought long and hard before I did it and uh, I, I, I thought... Why are we doing this? What, what's it for? It has to, when people see it, it has to justify itself. I think was, I was satisfied with it, that it was a way of uh, a sort of a lightning rod for other people who've been abused and also for people like Sam to, uh, to, to as a, as a sort of a, a platform to reach out to people. Um, the, so, but I was, I was concerned because it's a great, it's quite a burden, quite a responsibility. In, for me as an actor, in the way I'm going to portray uh, Jimmy Savile, and you have to be, uh, you know, it's a fine balancing act about, you know, how, you, how I'm going to portray him 
I can't do him as a pantomime villain. Uh, so th there's always worries about, you know, uh, I, I, I'm, if, if it's too grotesque, will it be triggering? If it's too, if, if we try to avoid the fact that it had charisma, is that, um, is that problematic as well? So you're sort of walking a tightrope in, in terms of how, how the mm. show is produced and how I play him. Mm. Sam, you have told me that you are comfortable with talking about this. Yeah. And I, I want to ask you how you met Savile? Well, we, we used to go to chapel on a Saturday night at church, um, at St Mandeville Hospital. My mum was very close with the priests, so it became my job to go into the back room and collect the collection plate. I could see the priest. Savile would be lent against a worktop with another man and I knew not to talk. I already knew not to talk and it really made me feel as if I had no power. He always used to put his hand in my mouth, like his whole hand, so I would be retching, you know, and try not to be sick and, and then while he'd done that, it got to the stage where he would penetrate me with his fingers. He, um, he touched whatever he wanted to touch and I knew that that would happen regardless. You know, the pain I went through to try and protect myself, lots of pairs of knickers and um, we, you know, at church then... Did you wear more than one pair of knickers oh, to I'd wear, church? Yeah, I'd wear as many pairs as I had in my drawer. So you were doing everything you could to, to, to put barriers up for him? Yeah. And, and how old were you when this was going on, Sam? About, it started probably about when I was 13, 12, 13. And can I ask you what impact that kind of abuse has on you as a child growing up and the rest of your life? It stopped me, I, I stopped talking. So I, I didn't, my communication went. Um, I was in hospital a lot. I didn't learn to read until I was 10 because when you have all of that in your head, mm. how are you supposed to learn? What, what space is there for, for normal life? There's no space. I didn't trust anyone. Um, I felt so unloved. So then when that turned into a teenager, I, I you know, I drank. I, I, used to t I used to use glue. It was almost like I wanted to hurt myself for feeling so disgusting. I, I felt like this was all my fault. Yeah. I felt all of this was my fault. What was wrong with me? Steve, one of the Savile survivors in this series describes... Savile as essentially grooming the whole nation. How do you think he made his way into the heart of the establishment? You know, he was a he was a friend of the then Prince of Wales. He was an acquaintance with the Duke of Edinburgh. He spent time at the Chequers with the Thatchers. I think he, um, you know, the, this the, the reason why the drama is important is because it sh it sheds light on how he was able to do that. Mm. Uh, um, so it was a reciprocal relationship he had with people that, that created this world, this universe, where he could operate. He, uh, he uh, built a character for himself, this, disp this antic disposition he would put on. So it was like a suit of armour. It was very hard to get through, and I, that was deliberate. And uh, I off interestingly, when I was studying, watching him, he waved his arms around, he waved his hands around a lot when he talked to people, in the, sort of around like this. Mm. And it was almost like, I thought, like a magician trying to distract you. When, when a magician performs a trick, they sort, of, they sort of make you look elsewhere while they're doing something else. Mm. And I think, uh, metaphorically, that's what he was doing, that he, he always tried to control the room he was in. And, um, and, 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 and then, of course, this, this court jester, the routine, that he had um, worked with the high and mighty, and um, you know, he, he, it, was, uh, it was the Trojan horse that allowed him to abuse so many people, and we try our best to depict that. Yeah. Do you think the BBC has learned lessons from the way he might have been enabled in this organisation and will continue to learn further valuable lessons? It, it's always difficult when an institution has to be culpable. My initial concern was, are they, are they trying to go easy on themselves? And Jeff, the producer, said, no, uh, quite the reverse. They want to put their feet to the fire. I think, really, the BBC is, is in a kind of a, a sort of a damned if they do, damned if they don't situation where, um, on balance, it, it is best they make it. And that 
uh, like all these things, not just the, the BBC's accountability, that you have to go through a little pain uh, to, to come through the other side. Well, let me ask you finally, Sam, your view on that. I think it's been really done carefully and, and I think that taking the time out to really understand what people like myself are saying and meaning, that, that's been really important. And we've been offered all the time, there's been support there offered um, if we need it. And we, and we all became very close making this. Mm. It made me, I'm really proud of this. I'm f I feel very proud of this for not just myself, but for everybody that's worked in this, because it's not easy to, to get, to try your hardest to get something like this right. And I feel that we've got it right. Thank you very much for talking to us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And if you have been affected by child sexual abuse or sexual abuse or violence, there are loads of organisations that are available to help you. Just go to the BBC Action Line, bbc.co.uk forward slash action line, or you can call for free at any time and you call, you'll hear recorded information on 0800 077 077. Catherine Viner, do you think the BBC should have made this? I haven't seen it uh, yet, but from those interviews, it sounds like it's it been done with great respect to the victims. I was very affected by what Sam said there. So um, I, th I think art can be made out of anything. Mm. It's, it's all about how you do it, and it sounds like they've done it in a really respectful way, but I, d I would like to see it before sure, I Sure, sure. I mean, Sam, Sam is an incredible woman. What, what do you think, Jo? I think it sounds like this has been very survivor-informed and is very trauma-informed, and in that sense, you know, I. I may or may not watch it, but again, I, I wouldn't know un unless I do. I think my broader point would be that we may rush towards dramatizations of, of these types of um, issues. And what are we doing as a society to ensure that there is more robust frameworks in place to make sure that organizations are trauma informed and this doesn't happen, that if this triggers a lot of people wanting to report to the police or get in touch, what services are gonna be available to people? And, I kind of worry that there's sort of like a chicken before the egg situation. Mm. But, um, you know, I think a great testimony from the person involved there and, and hopefully this will, you know, um, be a corrective for them. Yeah. Well, I'd, I'm not sure anything should be off limits for culture. I mean, if Spielberg can make a drama out of the Holocaust, I think that, that probably applies to everything. But it all depends, as you've heard, on the treatment. Yeah. Well, it's on BBC One from tomorrow and uh, it's on Monday and Tuesday, but all episodes will be on iPlayer if you do want to watch it. Thank you, all of you. Thank you. Um, yeah, giving up your time and spending an hour here in the wonderful Museum of Liverpool. We're really, really grateful. Almost at the end of the programme, let's just have a quick reminder of what Sir Keir Starmer, the leader of the Labour Party, said earlier when we asked what would change under any potential Labour government and how quickly they could get the growth they want. Some of the change that we need to make can be done very quickly. Right, so take, when take, would you take, expect that to lead through to growth and therefore more money for public services? Take planning. We can deal with that Could you very, the very question, quickly. Please, first? We think that this can happen very quickly within months of a Labour government turning in. We can turn this around and get the investment that we need. That's it from us this week. If you want more today, I'm going to be joining Paddy O'Connell shortly for the latest weekend newscast. You can find that on BBC Sounds, obviously. Next week, the programme is in Aberdeen for the SNP's annual conference. Hope you have a lovely Sunday and thanks for watching. More than 400 years of history. What 